Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 125, Supers, Capes, and Metas. I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record these shows live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and it would be awesome if you could join us. This week, we're going to swap things up a bit. I'm going to lend my bellhop hat and bell to Sean, who's been reading a ton of superhero-themed RPGs lately, and I want to hear all about them. Specifically, though, like what makes each stand out? How can there be that many different superhero RPGs and have them unique enough to be worth checking out? Now, sticking with the RPG theme, I'm going to deep dive into White Star Galaxy Edition, a sci-fi OSR RPG by James Squirrel Lover Spawn. Once we got to the week in review, I have one more retro sci-fi game to talk about, but this one, a digital board game. And I've got my usual BGA games and mask sessions. Welcome to the suggestion box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk, both positive and negative. It was a slow week for feedback, I think mainly due to the fact that not many people attended the Gen Con Spring Showcase, so didn't really have anything to add to last week's topic. We did get a comment on our crew, the Search for Planet Nine review, though. Luke Shiraz writes, My son just got this for his birthday. We played the first two missions, but I can see how this will be a challenge. We need to figure out exactly what can and cannot be said. And we can't talk about our cards, but can we discuss strategy? Well, thanks for the comment, Luke. Um, we mentioned this a bit in the review, uh, even more so when we offered it up on our list of great cooperative games to play with kids. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, this game, the, the crew is definitely not a walk in the park, uh, even for people who are experienced with trick taking. Like uh, everyone I played it with grew up in the Midwest where we grew up playing Euchre and Hearts and Spades. Now, to add to that difficulty of just trying to get the right person to take the right trick there is the communication rules and they are harsh like pretty much there's no table talk you cannot ever at any point talk about the cards you have in addition if you know something only because you know your own cards you're not allowed to talk about that either things like card counting and knowing you're the only one with a certain suit or knowing you have the last tr last trump card you can't communicate that this starts with the moment the cards are dealt this is why deanna noted this isn't a great date night game when we were talking about playing two players because sitting in silence is probably not how you want to spend time with your partner. Now, there is a way to actually communicate, and that's using the communication tokens. But even with that, you don't just talk. You, you can't talk. You put take a card from your hand, put it in front of you, and put a token on it. And where you put that tells the other player something, right? So if it's at the top, it's the highest card. Middle, it's your only card. Bottom, it's your, your lowest card of that suit. And in addition, you can't do that for rockets. But one trick that, that took us a bit to kind of click in is whoever the captain is every round is always the person with the number four rocket in their hand. So that's important to remember. They have the highest trump card out of every player every game. So that's one of the reasons there is a captain token, so you remember. Like, I think it really takes a few missions to get the feel of who should play when. And plus, you're going to learn... Uh, un unspoken communication from the players you're playing with right like based on what cards they choose to play for example if i know sean leads a one he's probably got some nice high cards in that suit that he's trying to protect by throwing a one or he really doesn't want to lead or for example if he leads a nine he's basically saying give it to me give me all your things give me all the stuff give me give me all my missions right now please so there's a lot more communication than you'd think for a game where there's no verbal communication allowed Indeed. All right, well, the other comment I wanted to bring up this week goes back to our very popular two-player games for date night article. CG writes, I love the list. We are a game family. I'll give a few that I found that can be fun and portable with small play, play, play space. Catan Dice is one. Another is Bananagram's Duo. Two-player specific and much faster and smaller play area than the original, but just as fun. Jabuka is a new one that we have just started playing, but has some really great twists on your standard word games. And the last one is called One Up. It is another word tile game, but loads of fun. 
I got to say, I am impressed by this list from CG because I don't know, we've been doing the show for two and a half years now at this point, and I have not played a single game on that list. And it's not often I can claim that. Like usually at least one of the games people mention, I've at least tried. Um, While I haven't played Catan Dice, what I have played is the Catan card game that's designed for two players and it was pretty solid now i played the old printing of it when it was still called settlers of Catan, and it used tiles instead of cards but that was one even better though and something i i actually had on that list and took off because it's long out of print was a game called starship Catan. no not starfarers of Catan, which has been recently reprinted with the second edition starship Catan. this is a two-player only game about exploring space and upgrading your ship and if you can find a copy, I strongly suggest checking that out as a two-player game. But don't pay ridiculous prices for it. Hopefully, someone will reprint it at some point. Now, Bananagrams, um, CG mentioned Bananagrams Duel. I have the original, and as I talked about in our Letter Jam review last week, I'm just not a big fan of playing letter games with my wife. Nothing against my wife, but she's just better with words and spelling than I am and wins all the time, so it's not fun. And I'm not sure, I, I don't know Duel, so I don't know if Duel would fix that in any way, but my guess is it's still going to be about spelling things with the letters you have as quick as possible. And that's just not for me. As for the other ones, I got nothing to add, except for the fact we'll toss links to all of these and the original article in the show notes. And uh, talking about prices of Catan things, 2005 3D edition of Catan is currently oh, yeah. on eBay for $1,000. I think that might have been MSRP. Yeah. Oh, wow. I honestly think so. It comes in a wooden chest. Oh, geez. Well, that's it for this week's comment. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. All right. So we're going to swap things up a bit tonight. I'm handing over my bell to Sean for him to talk about some of the games he's been checking out. Now, specifically superhero themed RPGs. And I got a couple questions for him about this. So first up, what's with you and superhero RPGs? Where'd this obsession come from? And second, what games have you checked out that caught your interest and why? So what are the, what are the most interesting ones you found? Because I know you're not going to go through all of them or we'd be here all night and into next episode. I know it's quite a list of games and I keep thinking, I'm like, how many ways can you do role-playing of superheroes differently? Like I know of a few core systems, but what makes these games stand out as unique from one another? Well, up first, uh, you know, I started as a comic book collector very young. Uh, I was actually involved in groups of comic book collectors and, and tracking values and things. And while I got out of that uh, and my collection tanked when the entire market bottom dropped out uh, in the 90s, uh, I still have a deep love for the superhero genre and comic book mm. themes and the way comic books present things and, and tell stories. Um, I, comic books are just a fantastic form of media and have so much value, not only in the super sense, but I know, like, I was introduced to some great works of uh, classical fiction through comic books. Uh, my first ever experience with Ivanhoe was in comic book form. Uh, and it was a great introduction, whereas the book, when I was, you know, eight years old, probably would not have done anything for me, uh, despite the fact that my parents were very literary and I read Hamlet at a far too early age. Uh but uh, thanks to many sales and some digging into free or pay what you want titles, I've really been delving into my love for supers and in the uh, RPGs as of late. There are so many to talk about that work in so very many different ways. Now, we've mentioned this on our show before, I think in one of our suggestions not too long ago, but one of the biggest trouble tr struggles in managing superheroes at the table is relative power. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are two main methods that games use of handling this. One, limit your scope. Uh, if you're playing with a group of supers, make sure they're all about the same strength, and then you can keep your foes balanced in relation to that strength level of your superheroes. Um, and if something is just, you know, colossally high versus your group, you don't roll for it. It just happens. If something is colossally low, you don't roll for it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, you know, it, whatever. Uh, 
that's the easy solution and, and keeps things sort of all, all crunched in together. Right. The other option is the crunchy solution. <laughs> Cover everything. Make sure every available possibility is allowed for. Uh, this is often charts and stats with mathematical progressions, but not always. You still need to have an answer for what happens when a street thug and Galactus the World Devourer mm -hmm. go head to head. And and those are where the uh, the super crunchy ones come in. Yeah, I know there was definitely a trend in the old days that every superhero RPG published was trying to do all the things. In every one, they wanted you to be able to play Superman or Spider-Man. And yes, I'm mashing, mashing my genres on, on purpose. Even Spider-Man's pretty power. You should be able to play Aunt May in Superman. Absolutely. And, and yeah. that was definitely a, the trend back when I used to play superheroes yep. RPGs. So just really short background on my history of super. So I, you know, I'm interacting with some authority. <laughs> uh, my first ever role-playing game I ever played was TSR's Marvel Superheroes. That got me started. And I think that did a lot to mold what I like in RPGs from then going forward. I never grew up playing Dungeons and Dragons with hit points and Thacko and none of that existed. I went from Marvel to... Um, Ghostbusters and then from Ghostbusters to Warhammer. So I, I'm more of a fan of D100 based systems than I'll ever be of D20 systems. And but back then I tried the DC hero, I tried the Marvel superheroes. I remember trying um the uh Palladium one. There was a Palladium super yes, super um, I can't remember the name of it. Yeah, it's, it's... I didn't own that one. I tried that one. I wasn't a big fan of Palladium. That one didn't try me over, but <laughs> all of them back then. We're trying to be all the things they, yes. they wanted you to be able to do the the galactic cosmic battle and do the street stuff all in the same game possibly at the same time and and that comes from the content right so if you're looking at marvel marvel has superman and jimmy olsen and they want to give you that experience that you get in their comic books mm -hmm. uh whereas if you move into some of the smaller imprints uh some of the comic worlds and universes are a little more narrow uh, and don't necessarily represent that full range of, of cosmic to, to street. Yeah. I think in general, as time has gone on, more RPG designers have found out how valuable it is to narrow their focus. Absolutely. Now, I said there were two methods, but really okay. there is a third option, which is really what our first game does. And that's ignore the ignore it completely. That's right. Who cares if person A is weak and person B is strong? It all comes out in the narrative and the mechanics are just a matter of hit or miss in the, and, and everything else is done in the narratives. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this. It's always fascinating to see how different role-playing games handle the same genre, whether that's fantasy, sci-fi, mystery, investigation. I am really looking forward to that. Each, each game does something different sometimes a little different and sometimes in completely new ways. I, I am looking to hear about the variety of supers RPG mechanics out there. All right. Well, first up is one we've mentioned many times, of course, and that is masks, a new generation from magpie games. It is a powered by the apocalypse game. That is really sort of the top of the heat in narrative superhero gaming these days. Mm -hmm. It's a very flexible system with a huge range of character design potential included in going by playbooks, which are mm. their, their uh, set of, of tools to build a character. Everyone gets, gets dropped into one playbook or another um, and moves on from there. But it's not without its problems for some people. Uh, it is a system that is specifically designed to play as young heroes mm -hmm. where adults have influ are, are important to you. Adults have influence over you as automatic and emotions are the wild and shifting aspect of what's going on. Uh, you don't take damage, you take emotional damage. Now, personally, I played this one. I've had a ton of fun with it, uh, way more than I thought. Um, I, I didn't think I'd enjoy teen drama in my RPGs. But I did love Young Justice, which is the comic DC Comics cartoon that was a big inspiration for this game. And I, the game I played, I had an amazing DM, in, uh, or whatever the DM's called in that system, Master of Ceremonies, whatever they use, and Phil Vecchion, and, well, a table of um, who's who's, right? Uh, the the Mr. Acton Mark fans, like the Wear Gator, Schmitty, Senda, all at the same table. And I had a great time playing Mass. And here I was like, uh, we went to prom. Like... <laughs> 
like I, i'll admit i went to two proms in real life but i didn't i kind of did it because that's what you were expected to do <laughs> not because i really wanted to go to prom so that was interesting yeah and, and mask is really all about the setting and the world you're immersed in so the gm makes a massive difference in setting the tone mm -hmm. especially for one-offs uh magpie actually offers paid sessions with professional gms uh that work with magpie to build uh, sessions at $12 a session for, for several of their games, it's... masks included. Um, I've actually been really tempted to jump in uh, on a session and, and get a feel for how a pro, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. you know, a pro is running uh, the game just as a way to help build up my skill base for, uh, for running the game. And to be honest, twelve dollars for an oh, RPG session—that's yeah, nothing. That's nothing. Yeah. And I would say they're definitely pros. They're getting paid for it. Yeah. Now, one of the things I want to do before we go forward, you mentioned this was a powered by the apocalypse game, and I know what that means, and I think most people listening know, but there may be some listeners or viewers that have no idea what powered by the apocalypse means. So, Masks is one of a number new modern role playing games that are based on the mechanics of a specific game called Apocalypse World, which was designed by Vincent McGay Baker. When the Bakers released Apocalypse World, it took the indie RPG world by storm, for good or bad. And along with it, they released the Apocalypse Engine to the public for other creatives to use and modify as they like, as long as you let the original designers know and got their permission to use the license. Now, there's no money. You didn't have to pay them to use it, but basically they wanted the ability to veto games, especially if someone wanted to take their system and put out some problematic content, they could say, no, we don't support this game. I. So what happened is... A ton of these games came out, Mass being one of them, and games created using the Apocalypse engine are generally called Powered by the Apocalypse or PBTA games. You will hear about other PBTA games tonight. And that was Masks, a new generation from Magpie Games. Now, next up from Green Ronin is what might be the complete opposite experience in Mutants and Masterminds. <laughs> This is uh, sort of the king of the hill for a more classic style super RPG, and it's not afraid to show it. Uh, frankly, most people, myself included, are stymied before they manage to get through character creation. Uh, it is crunchy. Very crunchy. Uh, it's all about power levels and spending points, and points spent on these stats affect points uh, that are calculated in these stats, combined with points that are also spent on those stats, and you've got very different attack and defense stats, and that's all before you even get into spending points on skills and powers. Um, <laughs> it, it just defining your basic stats and trying to to squeeze yourself into uh, a power level, which is how they describe their their games. While while they do cover everything from Galactus to Jimmy Olsen, uh, they do recommend that teams work uh, within a certain power range mostly mm -hmm. because you want your team to work well together and you don't want the one guy going out and doing everything while everyone else stands back and has a, has a smoke watch and, <laughs> you know, Superman clean up the, the bad guys. Um, but as a result, it gets very crunchy. Now, I'm repeatedly told by fans of the system that once you make it through character creation, <laughs> it's pretty smooth. But I have doubts. Um, realistically, I think with the, the struggle I've had just... Uh, trying to barrel through reading it on my own. I need to sit down at a table with a knowledgeable GM running for me or uh, watch enough APs, uh, even though I own the player's guide and the GM's guide and, and have been reading them. Uh, Mutants Masterminds definitely has a reputation for crunch, and it sounds like it stands up to that reputation. This was one I never got into. Uh, I didn't do Eminem or Champions or any of the other really high crunch supers games. I liked my Universal Table and my D100 rolls. Though I would have thought, like this is the sixth edition, I think, of Mutants and Masterminds. I would have figured they would have streamlined it. And what scares me is maybe this is streamlined. <laughs> yeah, it's... It's something, that's for sure. <laughs> so that was Mutants and Master Nines from Green Ronin. All right. Well, next, I'm going to shift back over to Powered by the Apocalypse, PDBTA, with Worlds in Peril from Kyle Simons at Sam Joko Publishing. Uh, this is a you know run-up to a version of Masks with Adults, and it had yeah. some real potential. I was really interested 
uh, reading through this and hopeful. Uh, and it's got a different system, whereas in Masks, you get a playbook, and so you are either the Bull or the Janus. And that's that, that one playbook frames your entire uh, character creation. This is actually a mix and match. Uh, so you're actually pitch, picking uh, sort of what inspired you and where you're headed to and mm -hmm. match those together to create your playbook, um, which gives you a little bit more uh, flexibility compared to the monolithic playbooks of Masks. But... <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, after reading through it and, and, and looking at uh, some other people's experiences with it, it fell a bit short, specifically in their implementation of what Masks considered influence, and this game considered bonds. Uh, in Masks, if you have influence over someone, you are important to them, and it's marked on your sheet, mm -hmm. and it gives you an, a slight advantage in a role. You know, you you influence this. You, you have uh, an ability to to influence or sway this person, so you get a little better role from it. It's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. With bonds, it's a value, so you can have a stronger bond or a weaker bond from one to whatever, uh, infinite. Uh, and but it's marked on your sheet, and then it would also be marked on someone else's sheet if they feel they have a bond with you. But you ch spend that bond to affect roles meaning you're spending how that person feels about you as a, as a currency in the game. Hmm. And it's, you know, you're essentially saying, I want to do better. So you don't like me as much. I, that's kind of strange. Yeah. Like that, that, to be honest, it just sounds like mechanics, right? This sounds like something they put in for balance and doesn't actually fit the theme, but they had to put this in to have some kind of cooperation system and they wanted some kind of economy in there. I don't know. I, it sounds like an interesting design choice. I wonder if it actually works better than it sounds. Like I've, I've definitely read enough RPGs that I read something like that and I'm like, eh. and then I play and I'm like, oh, okay. But uh, yeah. you're saying you saw other people saying, complaining about this as well. well so I, I think they wanted to do their take on influence they didn't want to just copy influence from masks and that's understandable right. because uh the influence mechanic is very much uh, a sort of an adult child relationship in the way it's handled in masks and they right. went with something different and it, it may work mechanically but the disconnect that it gives you if you actually think about what how it works is quite problematic uh and it's it, it's hard to overcome the fact that you're spending how someone else feels about you. Um, even if, again, as a mechanic, it technically works. Hmm. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, in the reviews I've seen, this, this mechanic ends up being hacked around or keeps people completely away from the game. Wow. Uh, what I'm now looking forward to seeing is their follow-up, which is not based on Powered by the Apocalypse, but is actually a Forged in the Dark game. Uh, okay. And that should be arriving in backers hands, including mine later this year. So again, for people who don't know what Forge in the Dark means, this is another system that was derived by an independent RPG that was very popular called Blades in the Dark. And similar to uh, Apocalypse World, there's the Forged in the Dark system, which has been released to the public. As long as you give credit back to the original creators, it's so on. Sorry, I didn't catch the names of that. I didn't, I didn't think to Google the names of who made Blades in the Dark. I don't remember off the top of my head, but it's a similar deal. So anything that's Forged in the Dark is based on the game system behind Blades in the Dark. Right. And that was Worlds in Peril from Kyle Simons. Now, next up on the list is a fun one that Mo gave me a heads up about on itch.io, and that is Hearts and Souls from Silver Lion Studios. This is a modern narrative game, but with more than just some D6s, making it a nice blend of systems. It's a simple role versus system, but they've used the number and type of dice in, to an interesting end. Uh, okay. The size of, the, of your die is your power level whether you're human, super, or cosmic. And the number of dice is your strength within that level. So you can be a really powerful human and just have a lot of those dice or a really weak super and only have one die, but it's a bigger dice than a human has. Okay. Um, and you only need one hit to succeed. So on a task with a difficulty of three, a human might roll 3d4, a super might roll 4d8s, and Galactus might roll 5d12s. Uh, okay. But anyone who hits on a three or better on any one dice, one die, succeeds. 
uh, a straightforward solution to the, that wild power level uh, issue. It's all about the difficulty you set. Yeah, I like the sound of that. That sounds mechanically solid. That sounds like a really interesting way to handle it. And I like the fact that there's still the chance the human can succeed. That's, a, that's actually a not a bad system. Yeah. And I do want to give credit. I did learn about this one through the Gauntlet podcast. So this isn't one I discovered on my own. So please take credit to the Gauntlet for this somewhat different take on supers. That was Hearts and Souls from Silverline Studios. Now, next up, I ran across an older system called Bash, with an exclamation point, from Chris Rutkowski, which is part of the Basic Action Heroes. In this case, Basic Action Superheroes, B-A-S-H. It's a relatively simple three-stat game and 2D6 exploding that, unlike many, multiply the dice result by the stat to get an outcome. Now that, I mean, this is, I don't know of any other games that I run into where you are multiplying dice by stats it's it. so the stats are a simple one to five scale where one is human and five is you know true superhuman uh super uh, superman basically uh mm. kryptonian level uh this same scale works for powers as well so you've got weak powers at one and strong powers at five uh it's a simple fun system and one great thing i got from the book was describing the game uh while I may never play this system, I really enjoy the concepts and I've grabbed some of their other materials related mm -hmm. to the game for inspiration and inclusion in my own games uh, as they publish a magazine and other supplements. Okay, cool. Yeah, that would sound solid too. Uh, again, multiplying. I, I, The only thing I think of is DC superheroes, the original used exponents. Yeah. And you would multiply the previous level by your level and you are always twice as good as the one under. But like, even that's different. Yeah, that's not it's not the same as multiplying your your stat modifier to based on your ability or whatever your skill. Yeah, and I mean like a two d six exploding. Yeah, that's you. By, you can get some really high numbers there. Yeah, so I would think so. You, it's again, it's really possible to get some massive numbers, and weak people can really succeed because of that exploding. Uh, just this week on Twitter, actually, uh, the, a discussion came up about supers, and a few people were saying, you know a real super game has to have exploding dice because it that. does allow that possibility of anyone being able to succeed uh, based on, you know, the luck of the roll, basically. So these exploding dice, are they versus a difficulty number? Is it like DM sets a difficulty and you're yeah. trying to beat it? Yeah, it's yeah. all difficulty. Okay. Sounds cool. I, yeah. This definitely looks interesting. Mm -hmm. That was Bash, B-A-S-H, from Chris Rut Rutkowski. Right. And now we're going to move on to uh, another old game, but not only old game, but old school style, mm. uh, literally with the official D20 system called Silver Age Sentinels, the ultimate D20 superhero <laughs> RPG from Guardians of Order, Inc. Now, this is a D20 open license from WotC as applied to supers. Now, this one caught my eye because I'm a huge fan of the Silver Age. I like my heroes to be heroic not dark and brooding. <laughs> now, among other things in this sizable 300 plus page rule book, there is a fantastic overview of both comic book history, but also superhero RPG history, That's cool. uh, which I may or may not be using as a checklist at some point. <laughs> um, now, this is only up until it was published and the game's a little older. I believe it's a 2003 uh, copyright on this one, but still, you know, there's there's been quite a few games up to that point. Mm -hmm. Now, as one might expect, this runs much like most D20 games. <laughs> the sheer size of the rulebook is so that you have options available to cover the various rules and needs in order to play out, you know, the D to, in the D20 style. But it doesn't really add to the crunch at all if you don't want it to. Sure. The designers have even added a simple one-page summary on page one of the GM section <laughs> that cuts through everything in the previous 168 pages and distills the game down into a list of, you need to pay attention to this, 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 and this, and if you want to, ignore this, 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 and this. <laughs> uh, for when you're just looking for a fast and loose Supers RPG. And I thought that was a fantastic add-in uh, for the game. Yeah. Now, one thing I know, however, in my overview of the book, this is not a modern narrative RPG written mm. with care and concern. And I feel pretty confident in saying that in 2002, when this was written, they didn't hire sensitivity consultants. Hmm. 
Now, the Silver Age was far from perfect, and many of the tropes and stereotypes from that age are understood now to simply not be okay. But acknowledging them is one thing, including them in your settings and system is another. Ooh. And while I think this system, as a mechanical way of playing, has some real strengths, you can't really ignore some of the problems uh, that pop up throughout the book in story and setting. Fair. I gotta admit, as soon as I heard D20 supers, I was like, oh, why? Why does everyone have to cram every genre and setting into D&D? Like D&D does its own thing and does it well for what it is. But that doesn't mean you should use the system for every single game out there. You're welcome, Jeff. <laughs> I own a D20 version of Judge Dredd, a D20 version of Star Wars, even a Battle on 5 D20 system. And none of them really do the setting justice. And I'll admit I was convinced the Star Wars was pretty good until I saw some more modern Star Wars <laughs> games and then tried the oldest Star Wars game and found both to be better. Now... The one thing I didn't see in my D20 games was any of this problematic content, uh, though I'm sure Judge Dredd does have some in there uh, based on the theme of that setting. But I, I just, I don't know. It always feels like the designers are fighting to get the system to work for them in this case. And, and I'm, I'm going to mention this again later in our review section, actually, this kind of comes up. And it just, uh, the D20, why? Everyone's obsessed with the D20 system. Now, I don't thing, get it. The one thing I will say is the, the concept of magic and superpowers do yeah. actually overlap and overlay into uh, a reasonable method. So there there is in some ways in superheroes a little bit more op, uh, opportunity yeah, to guess. use this system. But again, as we're showing in this episode, there are a lot of systems out there. And yeah. unless you're a diehard D20 fan, this one might not be. Before. Yeah. I, I, and you know what, to each their own. If you enjoy playing D20, feel free. I Absolutely. personally find it, I don't know. Like I said, it's, it feels forced whenever they take these extra settings and turn them into the D&D system. Yeah. But if you enjoy it, if you love Super Age Sentinels, do your own thing. That's <laughs> This is my opinion. You're welcome to your own. Yep. That was Silver Age Sentinels, the ultimate D20 superhero RPG from Guardians of Order, which also implies there are other D20 superhero RPGs. Now, next up is one that I should have known better about. <laughs> David Oakham, who is a fantastic artist and paper mm -hmm. miniature designer. Well, he came out with Save the Day, a superhero role-playing game. And I've got that uh, just right up behind me there. Uh, but as one might expect, if, unlike me, they thought about who the designer was, <laughs> uh, it is very much a tabletop mini game with area of effect cones and charts galore. Now, frankly, I don't like minis in my RPGs. This is me. I, It's just not my thing, even in a world mm -hmm. without pandemics. But what I will say is, even if you don't like this style of game, the art that he puts forth mm -hmm. in this book is a true delight. A fun, uh, silver and golden age feel style characters with the thick line style he's got for that are made mm -hmm. for cutting out uh, in all of his style. And so even, even if I will probably never ever play this game i'm not at all sad that i have it in the hardcover and can flip through and just enjoy what it nice. is for a work of art so it can it is full rpg or is it just like a skirmish game no no it's it's a, it's rpg it's a, with but but heavily on the, heavily, on the yeah skirmish. heavily leading to yeah, the yeah. tactical combat system yeah. fair enough i i am a personal fan of david oakham fellow canadian I, I've been following his work since the G plus days and saw him evolve to that. Like you say, he's got this very thick black line on the outside for cutting out his paper miniatures. Cause that's his main, main thing is bread and butter are paper miniatures. And he was one of the first people to do them. Like before you could get standees from Pathfinder even. So yeah, big fan of David Oakham's work, but I'm not surprised. It's, it's all about minis and presentation with David. If you ever see shots of his home games, it's beautiful terrain with all his paper minis on it. I, I am impressed by his work. But I, I definitely not surprised to hear <laughs> that he, he wrote a superhero miniature game with role-playing elements. Yep. And that was Save the Day by David Oakham. Now, next, we're going to take a look at an interesting take on a super game. This is from Re Anselmo, created for Beyond the Super Jam on itch.io. Now, this takes the standard supers game and twists it into a reality TV show. <laughs> where the GM, sorry, the host 
is working with a new team of supers who have camera drones following them 24 seven. And even more strangely for an RPG, there is a winner. Oh, that's right. Whoever has the highest popularity at the end of the season gets a contract, action figure, and millions of dollars nice. in game. The player just oh. gets dirty looks from everyone else. <laughs> Honestly, this screams con game in some ways. Yeah. And a fun one at that that's introducing interplayer competition as well as a need to cooperate to deal with villains, crimes, etc. Uh, no, I should point out it is designed to play as a campaign game okay. to play out a full season of episodes. Um, and I think it would really suit a lot of online play as not all the players need to be there for every episode. Uh, and players could be featured um, uh, on episodes and everyone, you know, everyone gets two episodes as them with them as the feature character sort of thing. Um, and the other thing is an interesting use of dice. So the DM is always rolling for your opposition with a dice pool built up of a, of a variety of different dice based on the threats present in each encounter. <laughs> it's it's a little tricky to grasp at first as you're reading through it, but for the right group, I think this game really has some amazing potential. That DM, sorry, what was it called? The host rule for the, the pool of dice, the pool of threats really reminds me of Marvel Rock role playing, where I actually went out and bought a set of red dice and all the different sizes. So my pool was always red so people could see it. Yeah. One thing I thought of here when you said that about playing online, does because it's a TV show, is there an audience? Uh, and does that impact it? Well, the audience is it really only exists in the popularity sort of score oh, okay. you get. Because all I'm thinking is stream that on Twitch where you have an audience. I it's and, and I'm just thinking you could definitely tie something in there. Oh, absolutely. I'm sure you could, you know, with voting and, and bits or whatever, you know. Yeah, exactly. You could absolutely. Uh with with very little hacking, uh, turn this into a stream. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Actually, the game in general sounds really cool. I actually used to run an older game system called Dream Park based on the novels, but I threw out the novels and the whole you're playing a character. But I kept the whole you're playing a character who's playing a character and you were playing a character on an ongoing TV series slash game show. Now, we didn't have winners, but we did have things like audience interactions. So the players would do something and I would tell them what the feedback was at the time. There was no internet at the time I was running it. Well, there probably was an internet, but not like we have now. Um, but I would like, like uh, there was a live studio audience. So like I'd start clapping when they'd be doing something or I'd start hooting or whatever. And I, I loved running that game and the players loved it. And it's cool to see that being done by someone else so i'm not the only one that came up with this <laughs> but they're doing it with supers which is really cool where we did literally anything because it was dream park so players could make whatever they wanted and they could change it up between shows so you get the same actor playing a different character every time which fit the season well but seeing that applied to superheroes sounds really neat absolutely and i think you know what now that you've got me thinking about it this would actually be a fantastic way where if you had a host um you could also have narrators so you actually get, yeah so you I, I would actually love to go to a meta level so you've got basically a stream doing the rpg that is streamed to another str uh, stream where you've got two people talking about what's going on and oh commentary co doing commentary and, and narrating over and, and over the whole game wow. as it's played uh and that would be the stream you'd send people to watch um, or they could choose <laughs> or they or they could choose obviously right um and, and just sort of you know have that you know call it because those people could be calling out to the audience while mm -hmm. the players and the narrator didn't directly address the audience at all uh they knew they were there but didn't right you know they were busy fighting crime or or whatever was going on yeah there's, a, a, there's definite potential there yeah and that was beyond the super jam from re and selmo now, I think I'm going to wrap up with one of the most different super RPGs in my collection, and that is <laughs> Spectaculars from Scratchpad Publishing. And that, that's the, the, big, the big box right there up over my shoulder. Okay. Uh, this is a card and dice system that caught my eye immediately when I saw someone mentioning it on Twitter. Uh, they were actually mentioning that it was hard to get because uh, at the time during the pandemic, the, the publishers were shifting warehouses. Mm -hmm. um and they'd been asking about it and and i looked into it and uh within a day i ordered it myself um so in addition to dice and cards they use tear off pads like you'd use for scoring in many board games but these are both for your character sheet 
Um, yeah. And that's character sheet in quotes. <laughs> and for what they call series or the, the published scenarios in a adventures, sort of. So the game almost feels like a deck builder with how much stuff you get in it. You got 290 cards, 22 dice, 60 tokens, and game trays. That's trays with a Z. Plastic. Well, the branded game trays. Game yeah, trays? Yeah, brand oh. trays for each player. Now, another board game-like aspect of this is every time you sit down, you can swap around players, characters, or even who the GM hmm. is, uh, which they call narrator, as there is no hidden information. Hmm. So I think my favorite line from the 60-page included rule book, which is the full size of the box, uh, it's not like a little rule book. No, this is hmm. 60 pages of double column, wow. full size book, uh, is it is a good idea to have at least one player read the rule book. <laughs> which indicates that you actually don't have to read the rules to get yourself up and running. Interesting. With with all this physicality and board game like elements, I wonder how this RPG is being received. Cuz like, I remember back when Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay went in a similar direction with cardboard counters, funky dice, card-based actions, progress trackers and a box you kept your character in and it had tear off character sheets. Like that was literally a thing. And the fans were up in arms. Like like they were really upset. I thought it was awesome. I ran a 3-year campaign with that system and thought it was amazing, but there were so many people who were like ah it's not an rpg anymore it's a board game get off my lawn and it was bad enough that fantasy flight actually re-released the game as a book-based experience with typical a dm's guide a player's guide and a monster manual to fit a popular theme but it was far too late because by that point fans have been forget it i'm going back to first edition or second edition or this is when Zweehander hit the market which was an osr retro clone of warhammer and a bunch of fans moved to that and i wonder how this one's being received now fantasy flight did go on to create the genesis system which uses parts of that rpg system so but it, they still ditched all the cards like, it's not quite as physical as warhammer was yeah it's interesting i mean now this isn't based on uh, off uh, an existing content so you wouldn't be uh, luckily upsetting anyone who already true. loved the, the true thing but uh the concepts behind this one are really interesting like there's a reason why you would want to buy that box um okay. and uh it's essentially a comic imprint so everyone who buys a box is creating a world with it with that mm. box uh so everyone who plays and narrates with that box is helping build a comic book universe so all right in addition to the rule book there's a setting book and this is where before and during play, you build the world as a group through questions and prompts, narratively defining everything along the way. Uh, hmm. And if you want to run three teams through the same series, you can, and each team will impact the other teams through that collaborative world building. So once a question is asked hmm. and answered, it's there, it's set in stone, that is part of the world. So um, now it sounds like Gloomhaven <laughs> or, it, or a legacy board game. No, absolutely. And in many ways it is. And it's, it's, but it's in, instead of a, a instead of a, a dungeon crawling world, it is, uh, you know, your super universe, your, your, your comic imprint, comic book imprint. Well, I gotta say that doesn't sound like something Deanna would like though. She <laughs> is really not a fan of the shared world creation. And it sounds like that's a big part of this game. That that's is. almost the main part of this game is making the world. Very much. Um, and on top of that, there's this fantastic character creation system. Uh, so while you have a, a character sheet and on a tear-off pad, that only records things like your name, some advancements, and a few of the narrative aspects of that character. Everything okay. else is done by cards, uh, randomly drawn and assembled in this game tray uh, to lay in, <laughs> into a specific layout to get everything there in front of you. Now, there are optional rules if you don't want to make uh, a random character, but they do specify that that will take time because again, you're basing this off of, you know, 290 cards. So if your, your players are going to go shuffling through cards to find the right power, take it, do that on a different day. Don't try and do that when you're sitting down. Uh, sure. If you want to sit down and play though, shuffle your deck, deal out your powers, deal out your archetypes, deal out uh, things and you're good to go. Now, do you do that every session? Like do your powers change? Uh, you can. Uh, you can do it every session. You can keep characters through. Uh, okay. they, they even actually have, um, if you're, so if, if pl a player from group A is coming in and playing with group B and those two characters share the same power, there's mm -hmm. only one card, 
but there are some uh, generic powers, sort of. That, okay. So you, the players have proxies. to agree. That, well, they have. You can use proxies, or the players can agree that. Well, in this game, I'm going to be powered down a little bit, and I'm going to use this okay. instead of. Um, and only one person uses the card. So that's uh, that's interesting, and it's all just laid out really in a really interesting manner in the game tray. I'll have to do some pictures for uh, for the the blog post, I guess, to to show yeah. off these game trays. Um, and then finally, the publishers have printable copies of everything should you run okay. out of any pages and a digital care, uh, creator pack with art included so that you can build mm. your own series if you've managed to wow. completely exhaust the four series that come in the box. Now, is there any expansions for this or is it too uh, new for that? It's it's still pretty new and, well, COVID. Yeah. <laughs> um, so myself and probably many other people really haven't had a chance to get this in front of people yet. Uh, there is apparently a tabletop simulator version. Um, <laughs> but I, and I, and I've, I've thought about discord, but it would probably require some serious character keeper magic and bot enabling in order to, uh, to get that going because of the randomness aspect. So uh, one, one really interesting use I thought of this one is again, as a con game, because if you bring your box to the con, you're bringing your comic book universe and allowing others into it. And then <laughs> every time at every con, more people, whether it was the same players wanting to jump in again or completely new people would be helping, joining into this world and helping expand the world of your comic book imprint uh, as a group over you know years. That's very cool. It reminds me of Todd Crapper, uh, the man with the best name in gaming, is running his, um, oh, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the game. That's terrible. If I remember the name, but he, he runs a con game. And what he has decided is that his con games are all in a continual universe. Right. And telling an ongoing story. And the one thing that happens at one con will impact what's going on in the next con and will impact. What's going on. High Plane Samurai. Thank you. No one said that. I'm thinking myself. <laughs> I'm I, samurai myself. was in the back of my head. I couldn't remember the high planes were. High, high plane samurai. Really, uh, a very modern narrative game with some rather unique ideas on narration and shared narration. But anyway, it was just the, the concept of the ongoing con game. It works really well for Todd. Um, one of the things Todd's actually done is he has gotten a hold of myself and another person who played the same character and wants us to duel out because of that <laughs> because where i went with the character was very different from where uh, jason pitt went with the character he's like i want you to like compete with each other like you're you're from different worlds or something but it sounds really cool and i don't know this one said of all the games you mentioned tonight this is the one i want to see like i want to this sounds the most interesting to me again as a fan of games with board game like components and like in the back of my head as a, as a part-time game designer i'm always fascinating by wanting to put board game elements in RPGs. And I keep thinking that you can do a bag builder as an RPG where the more skill you have, the more chips you can put in the bag or something. And I'm always fascinated to see how people have um, physicalized or added physicality to role-playing games by using board game elements. And this sounds like a fantastic system for doing it. But what do you do with all those dice? Is it a dice pool system? Uh, it's 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 uh, mostly um, uh, actually uh, uh, yeah, percentile. Um, but then okay. there's, there's a few other different, there's, there's challenge dice and I was going to say, did so, you say it came with like 60 dice, 22 dice? Yeah. 22 dice. So that there, there, there's, there's gotta be some kind of pool. Yeah. Yeah. There's, it's, 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 it's interesting. I, again, I haven't, and I, because I haven't gotten to the table, it's, it's been tough working through everything, yeah. but, uh, Fair. And, and a lot of it is going to be card driven, right? So unless you've got yeah. the right cards, you're never going to see what some of the dice will do. Yeah, and I can't see playing that one online, except, as you said, that there's a tabletopia with all the cards and all the physicality, maybe. Yeah, but, absolutely. like, whew, that's everyone needs their own box otherwise. And that's, yeah, and that's and, probably and that not ruins, the way you want to do well, it. And that ruins part of the, the concept of it, uh, yeah. <laughs> again, because because of what it is. And it's not, I mean, it's not a, an inexpensive box either. So, right. So that was Spectaculars from Scratchpad Publishing. Actually, app name. Is this their first game? Because uh, the no. whole scratch pad publishing makes me think they that do. they like the they whole pad a, thing. Uh, a, um, another game, maybe in the lobby, I'll check it out. There's a, there's, a, I right. believe it's an older, uh, a Western style game that they have. I just wonder again yeah. if it's using that flip pad scratch pad idea just because it's in their could name. Very, could very well. That be. might be their their meme. Well, that's it for my list of what's new and or interesting in the world of superhero RPGs. <laughs> We're gonna head over to the lobby now and see if anyone in our chat room has questions.
All right. So well, thanks, guys. I appreciate the uh, the the love from the chat room. Uh, you know, on on my my first official ask. There you go. <laughs> I think it did well. You're going to put me out of business here. So, uh, what did you guys think of the list of uh, super RPGs? I'm actually going to step back here, grab spectaculars, and show off a couple of bits. All right. So, what I want to know from the chat, we're going to scroll up, and unfortunately, I see a bunch of comments, but I don't know what we were talking about at the time people commented. So, um, we're going to address those. But what I want to know is, did Sean mention your personal favorite? And more importantly, is there a supers game you think Sean should check out? Now, personally, the big ones I see missing here are the big games, like the big well-known games uh and my favorite superhero game of all time now is marvel heroic role-playing from margaret weas productions when they for a very limited time had the marvel license Delicious. and lost it because <laughs> disney decided they were going to start doing some movies or something so they needed all the marvel licenses back and while well, you all know how well that turned out for them um so the rpg died that was my favorite system that had a very unique twist of you rolled a dice pool that you built based on your powers. And then when you rolled, you chose two of the dice, which was really neat. So you got to choose your amount of effect in your effort. And all that mattered for the effect, so how big the bang was, was the size of the die. Whereas the effect was based on how high you rolled. So like your D20 might have gave you the highest number, but you really, well, so there were no D20s. Your D12 might have gave you the highest number, but you probably want to use that D12 for effect. So you may end right. up having to use your DA. It was a neat system. So that's one I think Sean should check out. Another one that I actually gave to Sean to check out <laughs> is a fate-based game called Base Raiders, which is someone actually trying to mash supers with D&D, &D, but throwing out the mechanics. So it is superhero dungeon crawling. And it's all about dungeon crawling with superheroes. So another one I'd like to, uh, Sean to check out. And like I said, I actually lent him my copy to check out. And the other one is Sentinel Comics, but like I've got my sealed copy here, so I can't say much about that. But I have played that at cons under the awesome Eric Paquette. And it's like a simplified version of that Marvel heroic system based on the Sentinels of the multi-universe universe, which is now big enough that it's like it doesn't rival marvel or dc but like there's enough so you can buy sentinel comics and there's a storyline yeah oh we have eric oh wow <laughs> we have eric in the chat room Yay, wow i had no comics. clue eric was wow. in the chat room that's Excellent. awesome uh major kill is mentioning uh mutants masterminds marvel phase rip masks yeah. and icons and i actually just downloaded my copy of phase rip the the open free version yep uh, just the other day, so that is one. I mean, it's not like I don't know about it, but I'm interested in seeing what these new open, uh, you know, serial numbers scraped off, no longer Marvel mm -hmm. versions are doing. They are crunchy, um, you know, building out your 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 uh, phase rip stats with uh, you know anything from six to 160 based on your your power level, basically. Yeah, I, I love. Did you ever play Marvel back when I, I was never playing? played? See, Marvel I think with that you. I think we reconnected. Yeah. after my marvel days yep so i'm gonna scroll back through the chat here see what we got um there's our starting uh well mountain pop is asking if t about teen titans and yes teen titans is absolutely yes. one of the masks uh inspirations teen titans and and young young justice are, yes. are sort of the two key <laughs> yeah I, for, I always forget deanna was a big teen titans fan i did not i i was uh kind of like sean doesn't do uh shadow run games with elves he might, likes his cyberpunk pure for many years i was a marvel only fan i was not a dc fan deanna on that the other hand was a huge dc fan so she was the one that was into that um ryan asked about overpower was that trying to remember uh, I think that was the, uh, the palladium. Was about the palladium. See, I think name. champions, is, champions the palladium. is the palladium name. Yeah, and, and, I, and is, I am right? not, and I am not a a a fan of palladium, so I will yeah. probably politely not even not take a to, look at that. Not one. to look at those. Um, no, we didn't. Uh, we didn't discuss uh, uh, Todd's game. Um, I don't know if I'm aware of Pandora superhero RPG. I'll have to look into that. Uh, that is, that is currently on Kickstarter. Ah, okay. that is Todd. We, we did bring up Todd Crapper and I we talked did. a bit about <laughs> one of his games, but I did not mention that one. Yeah. Todd currently has Pandora up on, um, up on Kickstarter right now. Oh, I'll have to take a look at that. Uh, so Brian made a comment about mass being not only a very good supers game, but it's a better powered by the apocalypse games than any others he's played. So it's his favorite PBTA game thus far Pandora, i don't know if i would go that far destruction is that the one i think so yeah, sounds right. like a game of overpowered broken characters ruler battling games. great evil 
right. yep excellent there you go we got one new one for sean anyone got any more uh yeah heroes unlimited is the palladium there we go okay. oh that's the plan see i was trying to champion there we go. and champions is hero there we go yeah is champions is system. one I, I do a plan on on grabbing and looking at uh heroes unlimited is the one i will probably bow out politely by yeah. and to be fair i mean there are probably at least five or six other games in my rpg directory that i just didn't get to because they oh, yeah. often share a lot of similar concepts or, or weren't as interesting or diverse mm -hmm. as the ones we covered today yeah the goal today was to talk about how systems do things unique there i'm sure there's other d20 systems right yeah yeah oh absolutely so uh someone noted that i probably would have had a better time play, playing a super rpg instead of going to prom uh <laughs> potentially like we did it <laughs> They, they played one song that I thought was acceptable to dance to, and we danced. That was nice. Then we went to an after party. That part was good. Uh, except I tried to do a stomach trick, and that did bad things with the beer. Uh, so Math Guy Dave is mentioning he listened to an actual play. They quit after one session. That I am was, guessing that's that using some masterminds. Some masterminds, yes. All right. Um, not, not really at all surprising there. Um, Brian saying this, exactly this. If I remember correctly, that's when I was... Uh, somewhat ranting about forcing settings into the d20 system <laughs> um give them all the cones was a comment about david oakham's miniature game and i just dropped the link to the pandora game in the uh, chat room there there for thank anyone you who wants to take a look as i back the registered super super level right now uh, <laughs> there you go it's done yep sold <laughs> eric you, you better tell uh, yeah, yeah, todd yeah. he owes you yeah yeah let, let Todd know that uh, you, you deserve a uh, yeah you, did, you deserve that. a kickback on that one. Um, so Mountain Papa is not a role playing player, but really enjoyed the topic. So that's awesome. Brian also really enjoyed the topic and the range of games. Uh, Math Guy Dave was most interested in Spectaculars. Yeah, and Spectaculars is really an interesting system. And again, because of the flexibility of it is and and that that shared universe you're building it's real as well as i mean i bought it because of the cards i at the at the time yeah. i'm like oh supers and cards i'm in uh but then once i got into seeing the the way the narrative is built and the fact that you're recording the narrative in their own books in their setting book um it's like so this is this is the the, the scratch pad for uh one of their series right and it's just and it's literally you know Front and oh, back okay. pages. I of... thought there was more improv on theirs. Okay, so well, there's there's more detail. Like there is well, improv, but I, well, they, there's they, they, a lot they, more guidance there than I thought. These are questions. So this is yeah. this is they're all they're all they're all sort of multiple choice okay. questions involved. Um, cool. And then the setting book, uh, you know, you've got here is so it's like what's the name of your city? What's your city nickname? And then they've got you know what makes your city different from every other city. Oh, got, it's definitely a legacy things. game. You're gonna write in the book. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And you know every page has a question about truths. So you so you know cool. as well as all the as well as filling in all the questions, you get to uh, enter truths about your city that are going to be he, a fact for uh, you know evermore in the world. So yeah, so Eric asked about uh, Todd Crapper's RPG. I, these were games Sean already has. So yep. one of the reasons we didn't mention Todd's game is we haven't seen it yet. Yeah. A City of Mist is popular. I've definitely seen that, but I know nothing about it except I've seen that before. Um, <laughs> and she games makes uh, Deanna cringe. That's the cartoon, though. You used to like the uh, the actual comics, from what I remembered. New Teen Titans and Teen Titans and whatever. Yeah, and Deanna liked both. I now I like both. I I will happily read either. Um. Icons, I've definitely seen icons. I own a copy. I, That's I, my problem. Is I own probably all of these, but yeah. <laughs> I haven't actually sat down and read them. Uh, I do. I do own a, a a selection of icons content. I haven't. Uh, I got the icons assembled version, which is their recent sort of mashup of everything and and re release of it. Yeah. Um. But I mean, I've got I've got some kids stuff that I didn't talk about. There's there's uh, wearing the cape. Which is a uh, a very kids oriented game. Brian might actually be interested in, in that one. Again, it's wearing the cape, the role playing game. That's an um, interesting one. Is in so there. sorry, I guess, I guess I worded something wrong. Uh, and she games doesn't make Deanna <laughs> cringe. Uh, she's Modern not playing Teen Dream Titans Park. Modern Teen Titans makes Deanna yes. cringe. Right. Modern Teen Titans cartoons. <laughs> Dave, make... Dave saw my tweet. Um... Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah, and Sean back Pandora. So there you go. You're welcome, Todd. I don't think Todd tunes into the show, but that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Todd's an awesome guy. 
So, uh, yeah, there's, there, and like one of the other things that's out there that's fantastic. And, and if you are running superhero games, one of the, the tough things, if, if you like me, aren't running, uh, pre-written adventures is just making sure you've got the ins inspiration on a day-to-day -day basis to keep a, a fun, fresh villain of the week going as well as, you know, overarching plots. And one of the things that's really helped me is going and grabbing different source books on drive through RPG. Even if I'm never going to play I, the system, mm -hmm. the interesting uh, content they put out is fantastic. Although I have to say, not all of it. Um, <laughs> I picked up, um, I picked up one game, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bash on them. But uh, okay. I picked up a game, a, a system, and it was a source book, uh, all about heroes and villains, and it was, it was very um, robust, a, a, a significantly thick book. Until I got to it and realized that it was literally Marvel with the serial numbers scraped off. Mm. Uh, and I mean, I don't think there was a single original character in the entire book. Of, That's too bad. I mean, 200 plus pages. But, it, I, you know, I could literally trace the uh, a direct line from every character they listed to their alternate in the real existing comic book world. Yeah, fair. And that one, that one was, a, was an unfortunate... Uh, purchase on my farm but a lot of these are you know you'll get these little interesting concepts and someone will just have you know they've they played something and and they created some interesting npc that had a couple of quirks uh and and the, threw that into their game book and that's just something that's fantastic mm -hmm. to grab on and run with in your own direction tonight we're taking a look at white star galaxy edition an osr sci-fi rpg before we get started, I have to thank James Spawn for sending us a review copy after reading our review of the original non-Galaxy edition of White Star. So White Star, uh, the full name being White Star White Box Science Fiction Role-Playing, was designed, written, and published by James Spawn uh, under his company Barrel Rider Games back in 2015. The Galaxy edition original Galaxy Edition, we're reviewing tonight, came out a couple years later, was also published by Barrel Rider. That was in 2017. Now, White Star is an OSR or old school revival, old school renaissance, whatever you want to term it, uh, role-playing game based on the White Box RPG, uh, the Swords and Wizardry White Box RPG specifically. Now, White Box Fantastic Medieval Adventure Game is itself an OSR retro clone of Dungeons and Dragons, specifically original Dungeons and Dragons, like the, the box that was built in Gygax's basement where him and Arneson used to produce them themselves and they came in a white box. That's why it was called White Box D&D. To be honest, I know nothing about White Box D&D except it's older than anything I own or have read myself. But that is the basic mechanical system that this is, uh, what, that White Star is based on. Now, the goal of White Star was to create a rules light rulings over rules, generic sci-fi RPG that could be used to create many of the popular sci-fi genres, tropes, and licenses to be able to play those with a rules light system. All the contents of the book are completely compatible with the original White Star and everything published for it, as well as everything published for White Box and you can even steal monsters and adventures from one and the other. And technically, I'm pretty sure this is compatible with OD&D as well. I think by stealing, they mean sharing, creative yes. collaboration even. <laughs> yes, I shouldn't be saying you don't steal it. Uh, it the, uh, the white box doesn't lose anything if you steal it and put it in White Star or the other way around. Now, physically, White Star Galaxy Edition is a digest-sized hardcover book that's very well made and bound. Uh, this doesn't seem like the kind of book that's going to fall apart or anything. Like, it's not one of those ones that's going to sit on my shelf and the binding is going to go, if it goes, at, if ever. Um, it's 332 pages long, uh, a little bit more with some blank space at the end and whatever. Uh, it includes things like the credits and the character sheets, though. This book features an excellent and detailed table of contents, but sadly, no index. Uh, to me, that's a big omission. Um, it makes the book rather hard to reference at the table, which I also found even while doing this review, when I decided to look up the name of a couple things, having to find it in the book was not easy. So indeed, though I've had some books recently where the index they did add made me wish they hadn't bothered as you would use it and waste time before remembering it was garbage. <laughs> Go with sticky note tabs instead. 
Yes, fair enough. Not in mine so far. Now, inside the book, you will find a black and white book, which is a little strange to see nowadays. Uh, text and artwork all in black and white. It uses a single column layout with significant white space that makes it easy to read. Uh, in addition, there are callouts uh, that are reverse text that have optional rules that are well positioned so they don't break the flow. Like they're always like in a bottom after a paragraph or up at the top before you start reading. So it's not one of those ones where you're reading and all of a sudden you read, the, you know, the little call outs there and you end up reading that and then going back and figure out where you are. So I, I was really appreciated the layout in this book. Now the artwork is a mix of styles. Um, some better than others, I would say. They James went with 10 different independent game artists on this one. So there, there's quite the variety and breadth of artwork in here. You can find the full list of names on the written version of this review on the blog. Overall, the writing is good. Um, despite being a second edition, there were a few spelling and grammar errors to be found. Um, some sections do get rather repetitive uh, when especially get into the rules for Starship vehicles and Mecca, which are all very similar with just some minor changes. And it was obvious that I don't know which section James wrote first, but he just copy pasted it for the other three um, and then changed a few words and he did miss a couple. Uh, his, his find it replaced didn't quite work. Uh, what I didn't see, and this is important, is there wasn't anything that impacted the actual gameplay. Like any error I saw, it was obvious what I should have been reading and what was intended by the rule. Sadly, I'm finding typos in third and later editions of RPGs. Yeah. Uh, I think all we can really hope for is that when they do inevitably pop up, because mistakes happen, uh, they mm -hmm. don't impact the mechanics. And that's the real key. Yeah, and that's the case here. You, I didn't find anything that ruined anything here. Now, what I think I'll do next is I'm going to give you a quick chapter by chapter breakdown of what you'll find in White Star Galaxy Edition. So the game starts off, the book starts off with an introduction and moves into character creation, but not before pointing out something important. And that's the style of play this game is meant to emulate. Now, a big part of the OSR movement is a DIY, a do-it-yourself element. Players are encouraged to make this game their own. And all of the rules in the book are meant as suggestions or guidelines. If there's a rule you don't like, toss it or modify it. Throughout the rules, you actually see this at work with callouts from the designer suggesting optional rules. So stuff that James thinks makes the game better, or at least will appear to appeal to different audiences. Like this isn't like a modern D20 RPG, like the world's most popular game that's designed for tournament play, where every table on the world over is expected to be playing by the same rules so everyone gets a similar experience. This, like the original Dungeons and Dragons white box it's based on, is all about providing a toolkit not a hard and fast set of rules. More role play, less rule play. And that's R-O-L-E play and not R-O-L-L play. <laughs> so your attributes in White Star are strength, intelligence, wisdom, charisma, or sorry, constitution, not charisma, dexterity. No, oh, yes, I'm just saying them in the wrong order. They didn't put them in the D&D &D order. And to me, it's always strength, dex, con, it, whiz, charisma. For some reason, I don't know if it's a legal thing, James lists some strength, intelligent, wisdom, constitution, dexterity, and charisma. So sorry, I messed that up. Just because in my head, they go in a certain order and that's just trained in my head for playing D&D &D for many years. Uh, these are all stats you're gonna recognize, obviously. And as expected from an old school role-playing game, you roll your stats, 3D6, no re-rolls in order, top to bottom. Though the game does, of course, as I mentioned, have a call out with optional rules for using other methods like heroic characters and so on. Now, each stat does something to modify the mechanics of the game, including the very old school idea that a stat in the specialty of a class, every, every stat, every class has a specialty stat. And if the number's high enough, I think it's over 16, you get a bonus for XP. Like, I haven't seen this mechanic in a long time. I personally think that's for good reason. I never understood the, just because you're good, you get even better. I never understood that in a role-playing game. Other than the XP bonus, stats do do other things we've seen before. Now, this isn't the huge list of things strength does, say, in, in a modern D&D game, but, like, strength gives you your bonus to hit, bonus to damage. Constitution gives you extra hit points. Charisma sets your base loyalty and sets your max number of assistants, which is this system's form of hirelings. Uh, intelligence gives alien mystics their ability to use gifts. Wisdom lets other classes use meditations and so on. It's, it's the kind of thing we've seen for years now. 
Now, attribute bonuses here only go from minus two to plus two. So you don't have any of those 18s a plus five and threes a minus five. You don't have that big range that you have in the popular systems. It's a much smaller modifier to your actual die rolls. And, and less swingy isn't really a bad thing as far as I'm concerned. Right. But XP, because you have a better natural ability, just not kosher. Yeah, it's at least it's not based on race. So they they didn't they did not they completely avoided race, which actually is an OD and D thing. You though yep. the, there are no like in that there were races because you played an elf and uh, your race was a class, but they didn't even go that way at all, right. which I thought was good to see. So at least you don't get modifiers based on what race you are. So James did avoid that landmine and in, in a in a a progressive move there. Um, another landmine he dodged is uh. Alignment's completely optional. And I think the only reason it's in here is because you want to be able to play Star Wars with the light side and the dark side. And what the alignments are in this is star, nebula, and void, with star being the bright goodness and void being the darkness and nebula being someone in the middle. Yeah, I'm really surprised when I see alignment in games anymore. It's such yeah. a dated concept. But of course, this game is riding the dated concept wave, so not yeah. surprising. <laughs> and again, I think it's actually required to emulate specifically star wars star wars has a built-in alignment system thankfully it's not a morality system as much it's much more abstract now character who get some starting credits here and optionally you have the option to use serials now this is something i really like it's fairly modern serials is a system to give the character some background and it involves rolling on some charts to determine things like your home world type your family background uh events that happened in your youth the first adventure you went on it establishes adversaries before you start play allies the characters made and showcases one critical event in their path and i dig this because the whole idea of serials is so integral to classic sci-fi right your buck rogers your flash gordons each of these roles not only gives you story prompts, but also gives the character some kind of mechanical bonus. And they are all bonuses. For example, the character's home planet was destroyed. You get plus two to saving throws against fear because you've already lived through the worst thing that could happen. So still not as fun as a traveler RPG generation or character generation, I assume. No, not at all. This is a very, this is a, this is a D and D style character generation. Roll your stats. Write down your modifiers, pick a character class. That's going to give you some basic abilities. And then you're going to go shopping. That's it. There are no life paths here. This is this is just a bunch of random charts to give you some cool background, which is nice. But it's definitely no, do you muster out? Do you get advanced? Do you become a merchant? Did you get your own ship? And did you die in character duration? So no, there's none of that. Next, uh, we get into those character classes I just mentioned. There are 25 of these. Like, that's that's a huge number of character classes for a rules light system. Uh, way more than was origi in, in the original rule book. Uh, these are broken into standard classes that are expected to be used in any campaign. So if you're running White Star, you have these classes. And then there are optional classes that can be added to specific campaigns to emulate specific sci-fi genres and character types in them. These optional classes are actually further split to include the mystic classes. Um, these are the ones that can use magic. Um, magic in this is not magic. It's in the form of gifts, meditations, and something interesting called chitterlings, which we'll get to later. Now, each class is presented with a one or two played spread with an XP chart that shows the hit dice at each level. Um, and again, hit dice, like the game it's based on, going back to the start, everything rolls D6. Hit dice are D6. And you may not get a full hit dice every level. So if you're like a mystic, you might get D6. And at level two, you have D6 plus one. Well, you don't get to roll another D6. You just have one more hit point. And at level three, you might have D6 plus two. But then when you hit level four, you might have two D6. And then two D6 plus one and so on. Um, you have a BHB, which is a base hit bonus number. This is a number added to all attacks. Um, this system came out, the system this is based on came out before Thacko. So you don't have a Thacko that goes down. Instead, you have a bonus to all attack rolls based on your level. And then you have a saving throw. Now you just have one. It's, you have a saving throw and it's a number. It's based on your class. You don't get any of this more modern reflex saves, will saves, con saves, just one generic catch all saving throw. Now, along with this, there are a number of special abilities for each class, some of which you get at the start and others you unlock as you go up levels, a very D20 RPG based system. Old school indeed. Now, the basic classes include aristocrat with abilities like powerful speaker and silver tongue who build a retinue as they advance in levels. 
the mercenary who's a weapon specialist and can even form their own mercenary company at high levels. Another old school throwback there. Uh, pilots with skills like space ace and jury rig. Robot, which in another old school callback can only go to level four, but have a number of abilities like scanners and the fact they can be repaired instead of healed. Um, there are four different types of robots you can choose from combat robots, diplomacy robots, mechanical robots, and medical robots. And then we have star knights who have their star swords and follow the way and can learn powerful meditations. And I'm pretty sure everyone knows what that's based on. Now, the optional classes include alien brutes. Um, interestingly, this isn't just uh, the one you'd think of, at least the one I think of on the top of my head. This includes your falcon men, uh, a race called the Procreon, the Quinian, and the Rarer which is the one I was obviously thinking of. And a nice call out to Marvel, there are space ducks and wolflings. There is a bounter hunter, uh, which of course they had to include for certain fans uh, that can do subduing attacks. Brinlings, which I actually like that name, which are basically sci-fi halflings with uncanny luck. Combat medics who get the most out of med packs and can even bring someone back from the brink at higher levels. Ciphers for those who want some cyberpunk hacking in their sci fi. Deep Space Explorers who are great at surviving on four worlds and good at xenobiology. Freed a simulant, Q or Seven of Nine, anyone? Gunslingers for that old West style sci fi that you can't take from me. The Man of Tomorrow, going back to those sci fi serials and things like The Rocket Man. The Mecha Jock, uh, something totally new to this edition, which brings you to the whole Battletech, Robotech, Pacific Rim. Uh, White Star can now do them all. The Nova Machina, which even will let you do Transformers. You got the Plucky Sidekick, who has one of the coolest abilities in the game, in my opinion. One of the things is the Plucky Sidekick can use I Believe in You and buffs the rest of the party. There's the rock star, because, well, no game is complete without a rocker boy. Come on, that's the best class ever. The two-fisted technician with the aptly named bang it on a hammer, bang on it with a hammer ability. And the yabnabs, obviously inspired by furry bear-like creatures from a certain forest moon. Well, there are certainly some fun classes there, and it's amusing how they really don't try and file down the serial numbers too much on no. what they're borrowing from. No, it is it is pretty dang obvious what all of those classes are based on. Uh, finally, we have the optional mystic classes. These include alien mystics. Uh, they use spells like gifts and come from the same types as the alien brutes that I mentioned before in the last section. But this is for your, your Yodas, your guardian, your sage, your, your guiding character. There are the star pilots because, you know, some of those people who follow the way are excellent pilots. Spinning's a nice trick. Then there are the star squirrels. Uh, this one is a bit of an inside joke. So James, the designer of the game, has a thing for squirrels. And way back in the G Plus days, a bunch of them encur us encouraged him to put a squirrel race into his game. And that was not in the original book. He decided to include the star squirrel in the Galaxy Edition. Um, their weapons and armor are made of natural materials, but somehow still produce science-like effects like lasers. And they have small star swords and acorn ships. They have a special version of the way, and they use chitterlings, a special type of medication. Um, there are even star squirrels that have turned to the void, the so-called black tail star squirrels. They're the perfect unexpected enemy for your white star campaign. And then finally, you have the untrained initiate. This is your um, user of meditations that doesn't understand how they work that you find on the fringes who wasn't taken in by the uh, void knights or whatever when they were kids. Yeah, very cool. Though I'm not sure I like the idea of pilots meditating mid-flight. That sounds problematic. Yeah, it's, you know, it's supposed to be the, the it, it's, I'm sure they are referencing a couple specific pilots oh, I, yeah, from I mean. a couple specific series. Uh, the last thing you're going to find in the character creation system is totally optional, 100% optional, because the original game this was based on didn't touch this stuff at all because no one even thought of it is a really basic skill system. 
Uh, there are a number of skills listed that can be ranked one to five that are affected by those ability bonuses, which again, only go plus one to plus two, right? Or minus two to plus two. Using a skill in this game is dead simple. You roll a D6, and if you roll the skill rating or lower. So if you have a two on a one and two on a D6, your skill worked, right? That's it. Dead simple. Super light. But it's nice to see, because like I said, the original like proficiencies hadn't been invented when White Box came out. If you're going to go old school, why bother with skills? <laughs> you could play without them. Totally optional. Um, next up, we have equipment. I don't want to spend a lot of time here. This is your usual list of gear, melee weapons, missile weapons, armor, and shields. Interestingly, again, going back to the original system, all weapon damage is D6. Not that they all do D6 damage, it might be D6 plus 2, or it might be 2D6, but you don't need any D8s and D12s, there's no broad swords that do D8 and long swords that do whatever, and actually I hadn't mentioned it before, all you need to play this game is a D20 and some D6s, it's the only funky dice it uses. Now, again, this is something that goes back to white box is descending armor class, the hit system here, as I mentioned earlier, predates Thacko. Lower armor class is better, and to see if you hit, you actually have to reference a two-hit chart. Yes, you may eventually memorize it, and yes, you can kind of figure out the math, but it's more complicated than Thacko. You're probably going to have to use the chart. Now, thankfully, James gave in to peer pressure and also included an optional system for ascending armor class for those of us ready to move into the next millennium and make it so that you always want to roll high. You can take my charts from my cold dead ass. <laughs> Now, chapter four is a big mishmash of rules in no discernible order, uh, at least no order I'd noticed. Um, this is just like all the stuff that can come up during play that wasn't covered yet. So it's like, I don't know, it was kind of weird. So there's time. Uh, again, you're going old school, like original here, one minute round, 10 minute turns. Besides the fact, I think those are backwards, turns and rounds go the other way around. Those are long. Like I always found that odd. Like one minute's a long time. Like trying to play, that you're doing one minute turns, you got to describe a lot more than I walk up and open the door. Like that doesn't take 10, a, a minute and rounds are 10 minutes. So you're like each combat round, like, Oh, spells last 10 minutes long. Uh, it's just weird. I personally, if I ran this system, well, I have run this system. I just default to the basic, you know, two, three seconds per action with maybe a round, everyone going be a minute, but whatever. I, I feel like those times were based on like throwaway comments. It's like, Hey, Gary, how do we set up turns? Oh, just break them up into minutes. Everyone understands that. And then they moved on. I don't yeah. think there was really any significant thought put into that. I... There was definitely a lot of arguments over the years about <laughs> how important those times are. Uh, according to Gary Gygash, you cannot have a meaningful campaign without accurately tracking time. That is a quote from the master himself. So I don't know. I, I, I just the number of arguments over no, an attack roll is a series of blows, and no, each roll is a swing. I just play it your own way. It's a DIY game. No one's going to show up at your house and say, your turns aren't long enough. Now, as mentioned earlier, saving throws in White Star are based on one number, and it's class based. Uh, these are for avoiding. Uh, everything uh manipulation area effects meditations collapsing corridors uh the inevitable bridge fire that starts as soon as your ship takes one point of damage all of those you're going to roll a save to see if you're affected by it or not uh movement rules are based on feet and meant to be abstract uh though they they give a very basic system for using grids um by very basic i think it just says it's 10 feet to a hex or 10 feet to a square and that's it they don't talk about line of sight or anything like that uh, encumbrance rules are present, but fully optional. Another trope of old school gaming is the ability of players to hire hirelings. Uh, this was actually the norm back in the day where most adventuring groups would consist of a large number of non-player characters that would be traveling around with your, your player characters. Something you just don't see anymore. Like I, D and D parties now, like maybe someone's got an animal companion or something, but that's about it. Now here, they don't call them hirelings, they call them assistants, and you can hire all kinds of different types, from engineers and soldiers to translators and animal trainers, just in case you need someone to look after that rancor. Now, there is some other stuff here, like environmental effects, surprise, stealth. This is just basically the bash all chapter of rule stuff that didn't fit anywhere else. Ignoring encumbrance, thanks to NPC slavery. Yep. 
we have moved on from those days. Yes, we have. Again, optional, which is always nice. So up next is personal combat. Um, this is D20-based. Uh, there are two systems here, one that uses descending armor class and a two-hit chart, and another that uses ascending armor class. Uh, all damage is D6-based. Uh, initiatives by side, which is another old-school concept. The players as a group or the GM, one goes first before the other. Initiative, dead simple. Roll a D6. Whoever rolls higher goes first. If you tie, you go simultaneously. Um, and all that does is it, that everyone doesn't take damage till the end of the round. So if you die, you still got your action or if the monster dies. Um, other than that, it's typical D20 combat. Like uh, there, there's some interesting callback optional rules for those who want an old school feel. Like uh, the rule that you have to declare your actions before initiative's rule and then still have to go out along with them even after the opponents have gone and possibly ruined what you said, that's definitely another old school callback. Well, you like programmed action games, so declaring actions before <laughs> initiative is just like that. Uh, to be honest, that's one of the things I've almost thought of trying again. I, like now and then I miss that because you never get the like spell you were about to cast that gets interrupted. You can't really do that with most of the modern systems. And that was always a, a, such a trope of older D&D. Uh, narrative, narrative games work uh, work that way because... You, you declare your action roll, and if you don't hit, then chances are good something has come along to interrupt that action. That yeah, you that's true. It's a, it's a different way to do it. Yeah. Uh, the next chapter is full of rules for starship combat. This is very abstract. Um, things like speed aren't used to like move on a map or anything, or even just to figure out how many miles you went or light years or whatever. It's literally just to compare relative speed between two ships. One's got a 50, one's got a 44. Well, the 50 can outrun the 44, basically. Um, overall, it's pretty close to the rules for personal combat with some additional rules, like the whole you're on a ship, so different people can take on different roles, like firing of weapons, controlling the shields. Um, there are full shield rules, and shields come back, and you can change where they're facing. You know, stuff you'd expect from a sci-fi game. Now, one part I did like are some random charts for what's going wrong on the ship each time it's hit. Uh, I, I dig that. That's your whole, especially Star Trek feel, right? The, as the ship hits, the lights flicker and fire start on the bridge and electricity starts going out. And to me, that's interesting. You even see this in Star Wars, right? They got to go fix the whatever Chewie's got to go down the port and the Millennium Falcon and fix something. I thought that was really cool. Um, there's also rules for buying and building ships with tons of examples, lots of different ships. An often underused or overlooked aspect of sci-fi RPGs, and it's a welcome addition to include that, you know, you're not just fighting on ground, you're, you're fighting in the air and fighting in, uh, in space. Yep. Now, after Starships, we get something new for the Galaxy Edition, which is a full set of rules for vehicles and vehicular combat. Uh, this includes ground vehicles and atmospheric flight. Um, in the original game, vehicles were meant to be a story tool, right? Like you showed up in a Jeep or you're doing this. It was just now you can actually play out some Mad Max style combats or dogfights in the air. This chapter is very similar to the Starship combat system with some rule differences, like uh, rules for ramming, which they assumed with Starship combat that space is big enough, that's not an issue. Um, targeting characters that are on vehicles and stuff like that. It's still very abstract. And again, you got a ton of example vehicles, including, of course, the Yab Nab Glider. Depending on the style of game you're running, this could be a really valuable tool. Next up, we got mecha combat. Again, same deal, right? Uh, some slight rules tweaks for mechas with rules for combining mechs with vehicles and personal combat and even rules for transforming mecha and, of course, a bunch of example mecha. Uh, like vehicle combat, these weren't in the original. So this is a whole new set of rules for throwing in battle tech or whatever anime series you prefer doing the Gundam thing or whatever. Uh, again, it all depends on the, the style you're looking to reproduce. But can you do Voltron? There are no rules for combiners in the base set, though I wouldn't be surprised if some fan has put rules out there. There are transforming, but you're still in a cockpit. So you, the transforming went with, I got to admit, is um, less Transformers and more Robotech Macross Saga mm. is what we're going for. Now, once we get done with all these combat systems, which is a huge chunk of the book, to be honest, we get to mysticism, which is the magic of White Star. I like the game it's based on. There are a few different types of mysticism with abilities broken out by level. Um, some are going to require intelligence. Some are going to require wisdom. A character can use mysticism 
advance, they're going to get slots they fill with specific mystic abilities, and these slots are spent once the ability is used, right? This is your fancy and magic system that's been around since original D&D, &D, and it fits that it's in here because it's based on original D&D. &D. Um, the number of the classes, though, do have a more modern mechanic where they can spend their slots to do other things, which is actually, to me, a nice, an, a nice addition to the game, so you're not locked into, I memorized the wrong thing, and it's useless for this whole campaign. Now, star night star pilots and untrained initiates use what they call meditations, which they get from following the way. Star squirrels get the chitterlings, and alien mystics have gifts. Now, there are a significant number of these, but not as many as you would see in a standard F20 game, right? And it's like in a D&D or other fantasy game. For example, there are only 28 meditations split over four levels, and even less chitterlings and gifts. That's not really a lot. Now, these run the gamut, um, stuff you've seen spells do for years, like charm person, increased acrobatics, healing, detecting life, reading languages, manipulate objects, danger sense, telekinesis, etc. Now, what I did think is interesting is there aren't really any attack spells, right? You don't have any lightning bolts, magic missiles, fireballs. Um, I do think the Void Knight does have an ability to cast lightning, but it's not actually a meditation. Yeah, and frankly, I find this refreshing. Fireball is a trope now, and frankly, yeah. a poor use of abilities when lasers and magic swords already exist to attack with. Yeah. No, I agree. I, I was impressed by the exclusion of those attack spells. Uh, chapter 10, Alien and Creatures. This is giving you stats for both NPCs the players may encounter, both in the form of allies and enemies, and a number of creatures, which are mostly meant to be adversaries, but there are a couple potential allies in there. This is your monster section, right? Your monster manual from any other D20 thing with stats, a description, and special rules for each. Now, it's not a very long chapter. What the book strongly suggests is finding other adversaries from other white box products to build on what's here. Uh, there are also a set of suggestions for making your own aliens and creatures. And there is so much free box content out there. All you got to do is look for it and you can find all manner of interesting creatures that can easily be adapted to sci-fi. Now, what you will find here are monsters based on well-known sci-fi licenses like the Canics, which look like upside down hovering garbage cans with appendages sticking out that like to say obliterate in a tinny voice and the assimilants who it might be futile to resist. They really didn't spend much time filing off the cereals. <laughs> No, not at all. I, I, I don't know if uh, Disney would have a problem with this book nowadays. Um, so far, he's gotten away with it. But yeah, uh, it, it, it is blatantly obvious. From, actually, to be honest, a fun game to play with your friends is the what monster, what, what sci-fi license is this monster based on? That, that is a, a, a White Star metagame you can play with your friends while, you know, waiting for the other players to show up. Uh, chapter 11 presents a whole bunch of new rules for White Star. Uh, these are new with the, the Galaxy Edition. So what's here is cybernetics, etchings, and advanced equipment. So cybernetic rules are pretty simple. Buy really expensive replacement parts and get some kind of bonus for it. Now, there are optional rules for limiting the amount you can buy, but nothing as detailed as like the humanity-based systems of Shadowrun or Cyberpunk. Advanced technology is basically what I would think of as the magic system in a fantasy RPG. It includes things like powered armor, personal shields, and star sword gems, which uh, I, they didn't use the word spell kyber weird, at least. Um, you'll also find a couple of relics. These are basically your artifacts. Um, one amused the heck out of me because it's obviously based on uh, the Masters of the Universe. It is a pair of swords called the Edges of Singularity, one created from Star and the other created from Void. And when you bring the two together, magic things happen. And then the Key to the Cosmos, which was obviously inspired by the Nelvana cult classic, Rock and Rule, one of my favorite animated cyberpunk movies. Now, etchings are a form of tattoo magic that are only used by the Yab Nabs and the Star Squirrels, which is cool enough, though I don't quite know why this needed a separate chapter. I think because it was new content. I This should have just been in with the description of Nab, Yab Nabs and Star Squirrels to me. Yeah, have they made the mistake of cyberpunk and added negatives to the cyber enhancements? No, none yeah, at all. There excellent. is absolutely no disadvantage, to, except for the cost, of of buying cyberware now there is an optional rule that limits it but it's literally a a your con bonus plus something like five plus your con bonus or something like that 
So yes, yeah, someone with weak constitution can't have as much, but it, it's not really a negative for having the cyberware. Right. Now the next chapter uh, is the White Star campaign, which presents a number of possible settings for the game. And again, uh, as we've mentioned multiple times here, these are pretty obviously based on popular sci-fi licenses. Now, each of these has a suggestion for which classes are most appropriate to use for which setting and the tone that you're expected to play in that setting. These include rebels against the regime, explorers among the stars, invasion, brothers in arms, just keep flying, a thousand thousand worlds, and White Star and Swords and Wizardry, which is a small section suggesting on how best to combine White Star with the fantasy game, mainly leading to your adventure style of like the original Barrier Peaks, where you have the fantasy game and you find a starship, or you have your starship find a fantasy world, going either way. Uh, so uh, nothing unexpected there. I think that's all pretty, pretty much what you'd hope yep. for. Now there is, in a very odd spot in the book, right after this, a very modern house rule included here, which I'm, I don't know why it's in this section, but it's called the Deeds Dark and Daring system, which adds a pool of daring deed points that is calculated at the start of each game. And these can be used by players to do things like automatically succeed at a roll or prevent dying. Uh, so they, they, your character comes and goes down to one hit point further, have an ally in a timely fashion, or even be able to add something narratively to the game. Now, this is a basic version of systems we've seen in modern games like Fate Points or Bennies and Savage Worlds, though there's no economy here. There's no buying and spending and earning, and there's no way for the DM to give out more or spend them on their own. This is a pretty basic in-game economy, but I would, uh, to me, a real welcome addition to what's really a really old style game interesting uh but don't have really long sections or make sure you pace out your deeds appropriately so you don't run out <laughs> very fair very fair yeah if you want to metagame it oh we're out of points i gotta go oh sorry, i'm tired the kids are getting <laughs> up in the morning now these setting suggestions are followed by a chapter of random tables always like to see these stuff uh, these can be used to randomly generate all kinds of things um, or just use them for inspiration, right? A GM can just read off on them and decide to use stuff. You got creating star systems, planetary planets, what atmosphere a planet has, the primary terrain type, the native species, uh, technology level. There's a bunch of random charts for determining a surface encounter. And there's a bunch of charts for doing a space encounter. And no, these aren't all just like waves of monsters. It's like you've found a singularity or something. Now we get to the final chapter. I realize it's been a bit long, but I really wanted to showcase what you do get in this book. And the last chapter is called The Interstellar Upheaval. This is a complete campaign setting for White Star. This is very obviously Star Wars inspired with an evil empire, Star Knights versus evil Void Knights. The Void Knights are under control of the mysterious Supreme Lord. And I think that was before the Supreme Lord Snoke even existed. So maybe maybe someone got inspired by White Star when they came up with that character. Uh, four different sectors of space are detailed, giving you a hex map, which, man, does it remind me of Traveler, um, and descriptions of everything that's on these maps, including, you know, asteroid fields and bases and stuff like that. What I thought was odd is there's no adventure. And that's mainly odd to me because there is one in the much smaller original book to give you an idea of how to play this game. Personally, I, I think this is a miss. I, I think every role-playing game should include a sample adventure because that is the designer telling me how to play their game, telling me the kind of situations that should come up, what you should call for roles for, and what the characters can expect from the system. So I would have liked to have seen something in there. Sadly, you're not going to find this in the this Galaxy edition of White Star. And I'm, I'm really of two minds about that, honestly. While in some systems that may lend themselves to a very specific style of play, I think mm -hmm. that can be helpful, while in others, it can be limiting when the system is robust enough that one adventure really isn't enough to show off what a system can do and may pigeonhole the game uh, for many GMs. See, that's, that's fair, but then include three starter adventures they don't even have to be long give me a one one page sheet so like savage worlds is famous for this i can't remember what they're called but they're one page adventures and they put out a ton because again it's a generic system and to show 
aspects of the system, they put a different one page adventure. They have, um, you know, here's the setup, here's the type of characters you have, here's the perks that you should allow, here's a little short encounter, whether it's like a shootout at the OK Corral or whatever. Um, I think that's really cool, but there's none of that in here. Like, I, I include three. Like, I don't know, maybe there isn't a link in the book. Uh, give me a link to a free PDF of sample adventures. I just feel like it's something that every RPG should have. Uh, is there any random adventure creation systems at all? No, not that. Well, like I said, there's a there's a random encounter and a random space encounter system. So I guess you could kind of use it as a sandbox. Uh, you could probably do do some kind of like West Marches thing where you just take one of these star maps and every time you move to a new hex, you roll up on the table. But it's not really formalized. It's not written as an adventure system. All it's telling you is things like you encounter a Nova and here's a bit of mechanics and like, they're, they're mechanics down to like one role, not an adventure. It's like you encounter a Nova, you're going to have to make a shaving throw for your ship. Your shields aren't going to work. This is a perfect time for the DM to throw in a monster or something, right? Like that's about it. So that that is something I personally missed. Yep. Now, before I get into my personal thoughts of White Star Galaxy Edition and how it actually plays at the table, I want to highlight exactly what's new in this edition of the game versus this one, which I reviewed back in 2018, which you can find on the Tabletop Hell Hot blog if you want to read my reviews. In general, all the rules from the original edition is in here, as well as a another supplement that was published both in print and PDF called the White Star Companion. And all of the class supplements that were released, and there were a number of them, were included. Now, the one thing that James did cut out are the multi-class rules. Those have been dropped entirely. So you can no longer multi-class in this version of White Star. Now, in addition to these old rules gathered in one place, there are a half dozen new classes. Uh, the Mech Jock, the Rock Star, the Star Squirrels, and three other ones are all brand new. And as noted earlier, the rules for vehicles and mecha combat are completely new. And with those, there are a lot more example ships. So like the starship section, the rules of this, there are a lot more examples of different types. Uh, the advanced tech system is completely new. A uh, number of the aliens are all new. I remember in the original rules, the um, alien brute was literally just your rower. Uh, that's it. That's the only one. So they spread that out to include like the, the Hawkman from um, Flash Gordon. Um, so there are a number of new aliens, a uh, number of new meditations were adding added. So you have more spells. Uh, the etchings are completely new. The setting material was greatly expanded, uh, which is in my opinion, at the cost of the adventure. So they cut out the adventure and they gave me more sectors. And I'm like, ah, I figure I could come up with my own sectors easier than I can come up with a sample adventure, but whatever, that's a choice. Um, now actual rule changes are very, very minimal. Um, the only real big impact one is in the original rules, the stat modifiers were either plus one or minus one or zero. So they actually expanded the curve, making it minus two to plus two. Uh, but what there are a ton more of our house rules and optional rules that were thrown in. But core mechanics, no real changes. So in summary, what you have here is a combination of the original core book, the original, all of the official Barrel Rider supplements, everything that James Spawn's company put out, as well as over 100 pages of new material. All right, well, what is it you thought of this White Star Galaxy Edition? All right, first off, this is a really solid little book. Like, it looks great, um, even despite the fact it's black and white. I, I still dig it. Part of that to me is the old school charm, right? Like it's got that old school look because of it. I didn't even mind that it's in black and white. Um, the rules are easy to read, clear and concise, clear and very concise when they need to be. Actual mechanics, uh, they're tied and true. Uh, they match what this game's trying to do, right? Which is to emulate the feel of some of the first role-playing games ever published, which had a focus on rulings over rules and that whole DIY mentality. Like take this book, and do what you want with it. This is a set of guidelines. Modify it and make it your own. And that is exactly what it did. What I personally appreciated was the modern touches that were thrown in here and there to make the game more current and more appealing to modern gamers. Things like ascending armor class instead of looking stuff up on charts, alignments being completely optional, toss them out, and even a point based uh, plot point system right a, a resource the players can spend to affect the story that is a, definitely something you didn't see in any of Gygax's old games yeah there are days when I wish rulings over rules was still more prevalent than it really is 
uh, unfortunately, the the bad idea of GM as antagonist has often meant that in so many systems, players are untrusting of their GM yeah. and and not willing to accept their rulings just blankly. Yeah, that is the, that is the potential disadvantage of ruling over rules is that can be be abused by the GM. Now, I will admit. White Star, nowhere in there do they push that whole adversarial GM idea. There's never Good. presented as a you versus them, you must challenge the players. None of that's in here, which is a good sign. But it's definitely, it can be abused. There's That is the one thing where with modern role-playing games, you can very often, the DM says, this happens. You can be like, no, look, I'm page this. You know, you're not going to get that in this style of game. So yeah, I agree. That can be a problem. Okay. Now I have actually run White Star and it went so-so uh the main problem we had was getting everyone at the table into that old school mentality um it's uh, one of the big ones is the whole hireling thing right the whole assistance thing modern players just don't think to hire outside help to accomplish things in a role-playing game nowadays it's just not part of modern role-playing uh maybe a couple have them but like the fact that like your crew of your ship you have to go hire an engineer if one of your players isn't. And even if you're going exploring a new planet, you want to have a translator with you. And no, it shouldn't be that every player has, or someone in the group has translator. No, just hire someone with translator. It's, it's, a, it's a paradigm shift backwards in a way. Um, the other thing that shocked my players was the lethality. Um, that is something that's definitely changed in role-playing games over time uh, with most traditional role-playing games. Like Dungeons and Dragons used to be highly deadly, and now it's almost at a super heroic level where it's kind of hard to kill a character off without kind of overkilling it, right? And killing off characters isn't encouraged either, right? Whereas part of the, the thing with White Star is that's part of why making a character so easy. So that you're going to die and you're going to be able to roll up a new character and start playing the same night because it's nice and simple. You roll 3d6 in order, do a little bit of shopping, write down your powers and go. Um, the other thing too is the lethality in the saving throw. So there's only the one saving throw, right? Well, save versus death is a thing in White Star. So moments like falling rocks, void nights, choke attack, explosive decompression, or getting hit by a particle beam pistol, you're one D20 away from death. You make your save or you fail. Unless you're using that optional plot point system, which is why I encourage it, because then you can be like, wait, that's not fun. I don't, that doesn't happen. I don't, I managed to grab the wall before I get ripped out of the ship or that particle beam pistol happens to hit the piece of vibranium in my pocket and it vaporizes that, but not me or whatever. This style of play is not going to be for everyone. And at my table, when I ran this game, it was about a 50-50 split. There, there were players who were right into it, who remember the old days and loved the feel of it and loved how willy-nilly it was. And as a DM, I liked some ass. The, the fact you used a D6 for everything. Like you go up to a panel on a one or two, a D6, you get it to work. Like that's it. That's the kind of rulings that are made. Everything's D6 based. Does the bad guy notice you on a one, two or three on a D6, they notice you like that. That's as complicated as it had to get. And I had a lot of fun with just using that simple D6 to do things. The hard part was coming up with those while well, I didn't roll a one, two, three on a D6. So what happens, which I had to stretch my improv skills a bit. I, I liked it, but I will admit not all of my players liked it. Yeah, I can see it as a, a fun outing into the past, but I would struggle to make this a weekly game long term when there's a reason we've moved past many of these things. Yeah, I agree. Plus, there's also the fact that it's meant to be a toolbox, right? So you can modify it for your group. But you get to a point where you've used that toolbox and modified it so much, it's no longer White Star. It's another thing. And once you get to that point, you're probably better off moving to another system that better suits your taste. Yeah. Which leads me to my next issue with White Star. Uh, it's the fact that this is meant to be a generic sci-fi system that covers all types of sci-fi. Well, this is cool. Uh, it's great to have a generic sci-fi RPG. And I appreciate the attempt to cover that broad range of sci-fi, but it also means that it's not particularly good at showing off any one type of game. Like, well, sure, you can play Star Wars with Star Knights and the Way and the Void Knights and your Star Sabers, but it's not the same as playing a Star Wars role-playing game with rules for dark side and light side points and the ability to call on the Force to improve your skills. Similarly, I don't think you can really capture a feel of Star Trek 
without some kind of detailed skill system and non-combat force focused character abilities like well you got a couple class like pilot and a two-fisted technician there's no science officers or like there's no way to play a botanist in this like yeah you can play a different character who's a combat guy who happens to have botanist you're definitely not going to find a ship's counselor and what's an alien game without detailed rules for stealth and radar blips and a panic system yeah, it's really sort of a nod at everything, which if you're not a super fan, might yeah. be enough. But it just won't touch the needs of those who are deeply mm -hmm. in tune with those various settings that the serial numbers have been vaguely filed off. Vaguely. I, <laughs> I, I suspect that the intent for this game and, and the, the key demographic is the fantasy D&D lovers who just want to try something else but stick with a system they're familiar with. Yeah, that's possible. That's definitely possible. And yes, right? We've said it before. You can play around with it. You can hack it. You can make it work for Star Trek. But I just think if you really want to play an RPG in an established sci-fi universe, you're probably better off picking a game meant to emulate that universe. Now, that said, it does have the advantage over those systems of, the, of that super rules light. The, the like I said, D6 for everything, very quick to implement and use at the table. So there is something to be said for a rules light system and ruling over rules. That you like uh, look at fantasy flight game Star Wars compared to the size of this book. Like that is a detailed, crunchy system with a really cool narrative dice pool. But that's definitely harder to learn than White Star. And then there's also the advantage of only have to learn one system by the players, right? So we're playing cyberpunk this week using white star and now next week we're going to play star wars you don't have to learn anything new you're using the same system so swapping genres doesn't mean having to learn a whole new game whereas if i stay, start playing fantasy flight star wars and then i decide to play um i can't remember who makes the new star trek star trek adventures i know it's called modifius maybe but you start playing star trek adventures you gotta learn a whole new system from beginning to end with different stats and a different combat mechanic and everything you gotta learn new whereas you could swap overnight like you just all right we're making characters for this setting you can even bring your characters from star wars to star trek so there are advantages to it yeah and if you're already an osr fantasy lover it's even easier to take that side trip down into sci-fi totally agree now overall uh there were some negatives there but I'm, I'm impressed by this this is a very solid osr style rule set that's rules light simple to learn well, it does stick to many of the old school tropes, there are a number of modern optional house rules tossed in there to keep the game relevant for more modern gamers. Character creation is nice and quick. Gameplay flows well. Uh, the fact that it only needs a D20 and a D6 can be a bonus. So I think most gamers nowadays have a set of polyhedrals, but maybe not. I, I think it does a good job of being able to facilitate nearly any type of sci-fi role-playing. But I do think it suffers a bit for not having enough genre-specific rules. But being a role-playing toolbox, you're encouraged to make up those rules on your own. So it, it does what it's set out to do. Yeah, and then I think the original creation is where I hope the game would really shine. Mis mixing those different worlds in an almost Dream Park version of sci-fi play. Yeah, I can totally see that. And to be honest, that's a huge part of the OSR, right? Is the DIY nature of the game and doing new things and mashing new things. And to be honest, there are a lot of third-party people who have put out specific settings for White Star. So you can get that granularity required to really do some genre play. Now, as for comparing Galaxy Edition to the original just forget the original forget it exists there's there's no reason for this piece of paper in my hand here to exist just pick this up this is it, it completely replaces the old edition while still being compatible technically with everything that's in here and everything released for it which is important because there is a lot of fan created content for the original white star still works together what you're getting here is a number of older books put into one package with over 100 pages of new content if you're getting into White Star, this is it. Just pick up White Star, White Box, Science Fiction Role-Playing Galaxy Edition. Now, as for whether you should even check this game out, should you care about White Star, that depends what you're looking for in a game. If you dig the older style role-playing games, if you dig the feel of original D&D or Star Frontiers, and you want to go back to that feeling, you want to recreate it with some slightly modernized versions of those mechanics, 
then yeah, check out White Star. It'll probably be perfect for you. If you're looking to create a very specific sci-fi license or genre, well, White Star will probably work. You're probably better off finding a game that's about that specific setting. It's probably going to do a better job evoking the feel of whatever world that is. Now, if you want a versatile sci-fi RPG where you can switch genres or mash them together and works for all kinds of different sci-fi settings, this might be exactly what you need. For a more detailed look at White Star White Box Science Fiction Role-Playing Galaxy Edition, be sure to check out our written review over at TabletopBellhop.com. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. All right, so besides some online play, uh, like Rallyman GT, where I passed you, I'm catching up on purple, it's looking good. Um, I did play something older. Uh, something that fits that OSR theme we just talked about in our review segment, and that is Games Workshop's classic Space Hulk. Sadly, I didn't get to break out my original copy of Space Hulk or the much prettier reprint, which I have behind me. Uh, instead, while dealing with a self-imposed prolonged internet outage, I booted up a Steam version of the original Space Hulk video game that didn't require me to be online to keep me busy while I waited for things like Windows to be installed and to re-download LibreOffice, uh, which does lead me to an important side note. After you're done listening to the show, or perhaps tomorrow morning, depending on how late it is, please take a moment to remind your less than tech savvy loved ones about online scams. Uh, things like fakes, virus warnings, urging you to call 1-800 numbers, or calls on the phone from Microsoft or some other support company, as well as emails claiming your system's been compromised. Please ignore, delete, close the window, reboot your system and run out of or something. Uh, before moving on. While ad blockers do have some problems for people like the bellhop who rely on affiliate purchases, they can also help add an extra layer of protection for those less internet savvy by blocking many, if not all, scam mm. sites. I strongly uh, encourage uBlock Origin in particular as a trusted plugin to help stop such scams from getting to end users. Yeah, I personally installed that uh, earlier today. So that one is there. All right, back to Space Hulk. So what I did is I had to kill some time. So I played through all of the prequel missions. Um, I modified my flag and started the first mission in the Sin of Damnation Hulk. As soon as I saw the name of that mission, I was just flooded with memories. Uh, that was literally, it, it's, it's the first mission in the book in the original Space Hulk. And like I played that and I remember playing that at the University of Windsor at the Windsor Gaming Society in the Trillium Room. And man, like I just so like I remember the table. We were on the white table, the white folding table, because there were people playing a choir at the big table. And we were like, what are you doing playing a choir at a board game club? Meanwhile, here we are playing Space Hulk. Like I had such clear memories. Now, despite being quite old, uh, this particular digital adaptation of Space Hulk, this is on Steam, sticks true to the original game. Uh, none of this modern Space Hulk games with real-time stuff. Uh, this is simple, turn-based action point system, lots of D6 dice chucking. Um, the Steam version that I have actually has the benefit of being somewhat updated graphically, um, more so than the version I remember playing on the PC years ago, possibly even on the Amiga. I don't know how long it goes back. It didn't have quite the pixelated look. It was nice and 3D. Purge with fire. A yes. quote that sticks with me from that very first PC version to this very day. Oh, the D-Rock song. Get out of my way. I can do anything. Oh, I it, so... I, I have been a fan of Space Hulk for a long time. Uh, this is actually one of the few miniature-based games uh, from Games Workshop Deanna and I used to play. Um, now, when we were playing this, we were just dating. Um, I'm pleased to say this stands up. Like, it's still a fun, solid game. Now, I'll admit, it can be frustrating at times, those damn bolter jams in particular, but I had a lot of fun. Now, what I wish I could say now is, oh, now I'm inspired. I'm going to break out my physical copy that actually even has some painted Marines in it. But you know what? Honestly, if, I, if I'm if i talking the truth, it's probably not going to happen. I've got too much on the pile of obligation to get to right now. And if we're sitting down at a physical table to play a game, I'm probably better off being something from that pile and not just a game I fondly remember from 1989. Now, did you manage to get into anything gaming related? 
Uh, for me, it was just uh, one. We had one mask session, and then I've been playing Rogue Book uh, when I've got oh, some downtime, go. uh, along with our usual batches of BGA games. And I still need to figure out exactly how you passed me because I, there, there's a mechanic about turn order that I think I'm missing. I, I, that I'm that I'm confused on because I thought I was set to be moving before you. You but, were in gear four. I was in gear five. It's based on what gear you're in. The person with the highest gear goes yeah, first. Yeah, and I thought I was in gear five, but anyway, that's fine. Um, I'm pretty sure you were in four, and I yeah, was in five. I, I, but... I'm I'm sure I made a mistake. I, again, there was there was something that I was missing because I yeah. I had thought I had been going to be going ahead of you, but it didn't happen. So you're uh, yeah someone's at least someone's catching purple <laughs> yes <laughs> well you should be too you should be hot on my trails whenever you get to take your next turn yeah well how about a look ahead what do you have planned for the coming weeks all right so on the schedule for the next week um probably this weekend to be honest i've got some unboxings that i'm gonna do so i got a package it's over there it's over here i'll hold it up just for a second for anyone who happens to still be watching so i have this package here i'm gonna open up I know what's in here. Um, this is from a company that does component upgrades. Uh, these are going to be some metal coins that I am really excited to check out. Uh, it's going to be launching on Kickstarter by the end of the month, and they've asked if we could review them before then. Now, I don't want to open it up tonight because there is no internal packaging on here. So I want to do an unboxing, and I'm going to do it live so you can hear my reaction as I see these coins for the first time. In addition, I've still got games for my birthday. I haven't opened yet uh, because, again, I'm trying to be nice and do an unboxing for people instead of just ripping into them. So we've got Great Western Trail, Irish Gades, and Quacks of Quendenburg I want to do. And then I also have some newer obligation stuff that I just showed off on our last live show, including the new printing of World's Fair 1893 and Magical Kitties Save the Day. I don't know if I'll do all those in one sitting. I realize it's above my usual number in one sitting, but we'll see. The stuff that I personally own and is an obligation, maybe I'll save those for last because if the quality is not there, I'm just hurting myself. Now, as for game playing, uh, both our kids are worth us all week, so no one's no one's visiting Mim. So we're hoping to get in some Hogwarts battle. We, we have put that aside for a little while. I, I want to get that played. Um, what are we? We're on book five or six now. I think we're on six. So we're getting near the end, and I want to wrap that up. And then I also want to play some more D&D &D Adventure Begins. Um, despite component issues and my frustration with hasbro i still want to do a review of this game because i know a lot of people are really curious about it and wondering just how good an intro to dungeons and dragons it is so to properly do that i'd like to try it with four players and i would like to do more than just the one adventure we tried so make sure we use all the decks of cards and check it out other than that who knows hopefully more gaming than the last few weeks but we'll see and you might want to work on hiding things better after opening them on Wednesday nights, if I understand correctly, about your girl's discovery. Yeah, well, we weren't sure. Magical Kitties, I wasn't sure if we were... With the, again, that's a pile of obligation, right? So thanks, Atlas Games, for sending Magical Kitties. I don't know how quick they wanted it, so we were debating possibly saving it for uh, Grace's birthday, but now that's not going to happen because man like like lightning focus the kids walked in the room and are like my little one is like magical kitty saved the day mom 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 it says a role-playing game for all ages and i'm like oh and she's terrible at keeping secrets so at that point i kind of figured it was already shot but like there's a pile of four or five games there that's not the only one she didn't ask about anything else in the pile just that one and then later my oldest comes in and it's like, oh, what's this? Dad, what's Magical Kitty Save the Day? <laughs> I'm like, she didn't ask what's World's Fair, what's Sentinel Comics, what's, I don't even remember what else was piled up there, but like there was four or five games there. Kitties, like just immediate laser focus. So since both know that we have Magical Kitties, we're just going to crack it open and who knows when we'll get to playing it, but we'll just crack it open. It won't be a gift at this point because it'd be pretty lame to give my kids a gift they saw on my table. <laughs> All right. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Joe Swick. I was just talking to Joe 
online about how he needs to try worldwide wrestling and no you have to try it. it's a fantastic system one of uh this is not sponsored i really liked worldwide wrestling and i backed the kickstarter for the second printing so really I'm, cool game i'm waiting for my cards and shirt to arrive as well maybe hey maybe i'll run a uh patron, oh there we go a patron rpg how's that maybe that's a- that would be awesome joe joe is a patron he, i'm sure he could jump in on that uh evil john we need to hang out again soon uh, look for us to reach out on discord yeah let's see if we can get that going matt lichtenwaller thank you matt Roger Malosh, thanks for sharing your prototypes on our Discord channel. What was it? Yeah, I saw some good inter- good conversations over there. So here's another reason to become one of our patrons. You can get to check out the wonderful board game designs of Roger Malosh, including uh, Paramania, a uh, Fight Night in Canada dice game, and he's currently working on a new version of Euchre, a retheme and redesign of Euchre based on... Um, mafiosos right uh based on you know crime families uh, and then finally zopi thank you well that was the double bell that means my shift is coming to an end and we're gonna have to drop that portcullis and get those lobbyists out of the front office though the doors to the lobby are closed you can always find us across the web and social media as tabletop bellhop one word you can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com find the tabletop bellhop gaming podcast on your podcatcher of choice and sign up for the tabletop bellhop newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates as always links down below if you like the content we are providing and would like to support our continued efforts on making this show and our continuing the blog and everything else we do, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.